tardes, good evening, bienvenidos. Welcome to Instituto Cervantes Manchester and Instituto Cervantes Leeds YouTube channel. We are glad to be here this evening presenting the talk Homoerotic Desire in, in Contemporary Spanish Cinema from Pedro Almodóvar to Ventura Pons. One of Instituto Cervantes' aims is to promote Spanish culture organizing events that show our culture's variety of creators and topics. Committed to that idea, Professor Santiago Fowles bring us a, a talk where he examines the evolution of the gay male character and the homoerotic gays in contemporary Spanish cinema. Santiago Fold is a professor of Hispanic studies and film studies at Darang University, where he has been based since 1999. He is author of books such as Cuerpos de Cine, Life Flesh, The Male Body in Contemporary Spanish Cinema, co-authored with Alfredo Martinez Esposito, and editor of five books, including El Legado Cinematográfico de Vigas Luna. He is an editorial board member of studies in Spanish and Latin American cinema. Also, he coordinates with Betty Vigas the Vigas Luna tribute, which had a magnificent exhibition at the Instituto Cervantes Manchester. Before I hand over, I would like to especially thank Santiago because he has been essential in the organization of this event at Instituto Cervantes in Manchester and Leeds. And without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Santiago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, and thank you to the Instituto Cervantes, not only for this invitation, but also for the uh, opportunity to uh, collaborate with the Vigas Luna Tribute, uh, which, as you mentioned, had uh, a stop in Manchester uh, about a year or so ago uh, with, a, with an exhibition which was part of the event. Um, so I'm very grateful to, to you all for that and also for, for this invitation. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to share my screen where I have a, a presentation. And let's start from the beginning. So in this talk, I intend to give an overview of the evolution of the gay male character in Spanish cinema, a task that thankfully is impossible to achieve in a 45 minute talk but I will do my best. The history of homosexuality in Spanish uh, cinema has been widely documented in a plethora of articles, PhD theses, and books published in the last three decades or so, starting with pioneering a work by um, Paul Julian Smith with his book, uh, Laws of Desire, published originally in 1992 and then translated into Spanish, and uh, culminating this decade with uh, a number of volumes, including uh, two dedicated monographs by Alejandro Melero Salvador about uh, gays and lesbians in Spanish cinema during the transition that was the first book, Placeres Ocultos, from 2010, and more recently, Violetas de España, about gays and lesbians in Franco cinema, cinema of the Franco period, that was published in 2017. Of course, Chris Perrian's book, Spanish queer cinema is also essential to understand the history of um, gays, lesbian and transsexual characters in, in Spanish cinema of the last few decades. And Alberto Berzosa's book, Homoerejías Filmicas, Cine Homosexual Subversivo en España en los años 70 y 80, that was published in 2014 and of course focuses on those two decades. There are also crucial volumes on Spanish LGBTQ culture by Alberto Mira, which I wanted to, to highlight. And uh, he also has a, a book on uh, gays and lesbians in cinema that goes beyond Spain, but has a very thorough and a very impressive range actually of Spanish films in it too. And finally, and this is really a selection, but I also wanted to um, highlight Alfredo Martinez Exposito's book um, originally published in 1998. What you see there on the screen is the latest edition, which is quite recent, Los Escribas Furiosos. It's a book that doesn't touch on cinema, it's more about um, fiction, but for me it was uh, groundbreaking in terms of establishing uh, new pathways for queer reading of the Spanish cultural artifacts. As these studies convincingly argue, we have come a very long way from the veiled representations of the Francoist period studied by Juan Carlos Alfeo Álvarez in his article of 2000 and his also pioneering PhD thesis, La imagen del personaje homosexual masculino como protagonista en la cinematografía española, 
defended at the Complutense in Madrid in 2003 and available online. These veiled representations would include, perhaps most famously, Luis Maria um, Delgado's, um, sorry, I'm just going back here, um, Luis Maria Delgado's uh, film Diferente that we have on the screen now, which is often cited and studied in the uh, books that I've mentioned, among other articles and publications, and were quickly followed uh, during the transition period with key works by uh, filmmakers, including, of course, Eloy de la Iglesia. And on the screen you have uh, the film El Diputado, Confessions of, Confessions of a Congressman from 1978. Ventura Pons, to whom I will return in part two of this talk, and of course, Pedro Almodóvar, whose early film of the 1980s, including Laberinto de Pasiones, did so much to increase visibility of LGBTQ uh, characters throughout the early part of that decade, with characters played by very important actors such as Antonio Banderas and Imanol Arias that we can see in this uh, short clip. Um, in theory, these films also did a lot to move same-sex relationships away from a context of criminality and danger, with realistically at the time perhaps characterize those relationships in the films of Eloy de la Iglesia, for example. We have an example here. Authors, including uh, Ricardo Llamas, uh, have claimed that gay male representation in Spanish cinema evolved in the opposite direction during the 1990s, moving from a period of invisibility and, let's say, darkness, oftentimes quite literally, to levels of visibility that would have been unthinkable only a decade earlier. This putative overexposure of gay men and especially gay male bodies in Spanish films since the 1990s, what Jamas referred to as hypercorporeality, however, did not necessarily bring about sexual satisfaction for gay male characters on the screen, nor, importantly, for gay male audiences, which I'm focusing on in this uh, talk. In what Chris Perriam and I, writing 20 years ago in 2000, described as a mini-explosion of gay-themed films in the late 1990s, sex acts between men were often depicted, but also consistently veiled. And I'm using Alfeo Alvarez's term here on purpose. He used that term for the early uh, model of, of gay characters, uh, were often veiled, not clearly gay, but I'm talking here about veiling sex acts between men in later films. And, and that veiling took place through uh, a number of techniques that would appear as regressive in, in some ways. And, and I will turn my attention to that now. While male nudity has become commonplace in recent Spanish cinema, sex scenes between men are still relatively rare obliquely represented or extremely short, often interrupted halfway through. Many films of the last two decades still present sex between men as illicit in some way. It is still often presented in contexts associated with criminality, age or class differences presented as unsurmountable, deceptive or catalyst for illness and death. Despite the much celebrated legal and social advances of LGBTQ communities in Spain, and despite a noticeably increased visibility on film and media, a perceived sense of risk and fear of being caught still characterizes much gay sex on the screen. As a result, the sex scenes are often cut short, thus, as I said before, frustrating the visual sensual pleasure of the gay spectator by creating a sense of distance and sexual dissatisfaction. Almodovar's La Ley del Deseo, Law of Isaiah from 1987, often heralded as exemplary in his representation of same-sex relationships between men, famously opens with a film within a film that presents the nude male body in ways that, as Jackson has argued, encourage, and I quote, maximal identification between both screen spectator, pleasure and activity, end of quote especially at a time when the panic associated with HIV and AIDS 
had reached a peak in the Western world, leading to an increase of both male masturbation films and the practice itself. The most explicit gay scene between Pablo, played by Eusebio Poncela, and Antonio, played by Antonio Banderas, is encouraging in that film in its direct depiction of gay sex, but it quickly turns into an awkward experience for the spectator due to Antonio's painful facial expressions and a false start. The scene is presented from an intrusive overhead, overhead shot that detracts from the sense of intimacy. Antonio's outstretched arms, as we can see here, um, seem to martyrize him in some way. He looks like he's about to be crucified. The necessary interruption to reach for the lubricant leads to a sudden end when Pablo turns the light off, as we'll see here. As with so many other examples, the scene ends before the action starts. Gay sex scenes in Almodovar's more recent work are still relatively scarce and surprisingly low-key. La Mala Educación, Bad Education, from 2004, contains some of the most explicit examples of gay sex in his filmography. Yet, while homoerotic desire impregnates the entire visual narrative of the film, there's no doubt about that, the entangled plot lines and the confusion surrounding the identity of some characters make for uncomfortable viewing. In a crucial sex scene between Ángel Juan, played by Gael García Bernal, and Enrique, played by Fele Martínez, the camera focuses on the facial expressions of the characters, especially the former. As San Marie Jagos, among others, have explained, even in hardcore pornography, the face is often used as a substitute for those parts of genital sex that cannot be shown for practical technological limitations. For obvious reasons, this is also necessary in mainstream film, even in the most liberal markets. Close-up shots of the face and soundtrack are used to convey, convey sexual pleasure, even when the expression may appear one of pain, as is the case here. Once again, however, the scene ends midway with another fade to black. In Los Amantes Pasajeros, I'm so excited, from 2013, gay sex is quite literally kept in the closet. For those of you who haven't seen the film, most of the action takes place inside the cabin of a long haul flight that is experiencing technical uh, difficulties. In an attempt to calm down the increasingly anxious passengers, the cabin crew administer, administers a sedative drink to those traveling in economy class and an explosive combination of alcohol and drugs to those in business class. In the bacchanal there ensues, heterosexual sex is depict depicted quite explicitly. In contrast, however, the sex scene between the cap Captain Alec, Alex, played by Antonio de la Torre, a married man, and Chief Steward um, José Ra, played by Javier Camara, happens behind closed doors in the plane's bathroom. The door, constantly pushed by the two lovers as they seem to have sex, works as a humorous and brilliant metaphor for Alex's closet, but the storyline and visual representation of gay sex are less than satisfactory for the gay male spectator. Besides editing, lighting and camera work, the most common form of disruption is actual interruption by various characters often friends or family members, but especially unsuspecting wives of men who are involved in gay affairs. A good example, perhaps, is the popular comedy Perdona Bonita, pero Lucas me quería a mí, directed by the late Dunia Ayaso and Feliz Abroso in 1997. In this film, three gay men share an apartment with an attractive heterosexual man, with uh, whom each of them separately fantasize to be having an affair. Not only are these affairs a figment of their imagination, even in their fantasies, they interrupt one another during their imagined sex acts. There are other examples of interruption by a family member in another sex scene in Almodóvar's La Mala Educación and also in Gerardo Veras's Segunda Piel, 
second skin, another important film that I don't really have time to cover here, but where sex is interrupted with phone calls from one of the characters' um, wives. Examples of girlfriends or uh, wives interrupting gay lovers in the shower include Bigas Lunas's Didi Hollywood in 2010 or the more recent El Sexo de Los Angeles, um, Angels of Sex, uh, directed by Villaverde in 2012, as we can see in these short clips. Mothers are also good at interrupting intimacy between men. Examples include Trek Town and Reinas. Trek Town is the, the film directed by Juan Flan in 2007 and Reinas uh, directed by Gomez Pereira in 2005. We can see the examples here. These interruptions are particularly interesting in the context of these light comedies. The shock provides comic relief with a Freudian joke at the expense of the homosexual men's overbearing mothers, and also through the gay reversal of the primal scene. Importantly, the effect of these interruptions is double-edged. Laughter, laughter is used to casually provide evidence of visibility and a sense of domesticity and familial acceptance. This provides an interesting counterpart to those previous cases where gay sex was always undercover. In that sense, while frustrating the erotic potential of the scene, these moments also add political currency to the films. Indeed, despite their limitations and problems, if there's anything that can be said about the evolution of same-sex relationships in the Spanish cinema over the last few decades, is that they are a good testimony of evolving social attitudes towards LGBTQ plus people in Spain, from invisibility to boundary breaking, risk-taking encounters defined by laws such as the Ley de Vagos y Maleantes or the Ley de Peligrosidad y Rehabilitación Social, which was not really applied in the democratic period, but was only abolished in the mid-90s. Um, so from that, to increase visibility, even assimilation, and acceptance, with its own problems, of course. The implications of this evolution with regards to key issues such as uh, family relations, space, or the body are explored at length in a PhD thesis by Adrián Gras Velázquez, uh, presented in 2013 and defended at Durham University, which I strongly recommend, and that is actually available also online from the Durham e-thesis repository. If Eloy de la Iglesia's Los Placeres Ocultos, Hidden Pleasures from 1978, was a good illustration of a time when homosexuality was associated with risk and delinquency, his final film that we can see here, Los Novios Bulgaros, Bulgarian Lovers from 2003, an adaptation of the ominous novel by Eduardo Mendicuti, is equally interesting in its depiction of transnational same-sex relationships between men, among other things. This not only illustrates the more ethnically diverse and arguably accepting Spain, but also establishes a new sexual hierarchy between characters that come from sociocultural backgrounds where homosexuality is still taboo. This applies to Mike Rueda's uh, 2004 film Escondidas, and in more complex ways to Roberto Castón's Under, films that reimagine sexualities and borders compellingly, also in terms of their sophisticated visual narratives that Alfredo Martinez Exposito and I explore in a book chapter in James Williams's edited collection, Queen the Migrant, um, in contemporary European cinema that has literally just appeared on Routledge um, in the last week. That's why I have it with me here. So uh, I hope that that overview was um, enough to, to move on to the, to the second part of, of the talk. Uh, which is focused on the Catalan filmmaker Ventura Pons as a particularly um, interesting case study, in my view. And, and that in itself, you know, provides a, a good overview of the evolution of gay male characters in recent Spanish cinema, not so recent, as we will see. Research on Ventura Pons has tended to focus on issues of space and place, language, national identity, or literary adaptation, often in the context of the tensions between Spanish and Catalan national identities that underlie a lot of his films. 
The Importance of Sex and the Centrality of Same-Sex Male Relations in much of his work, however, has caught the attention of international audiences and critics beyond Spain, um, uh, between, beyond Spanish and Catalan studies. In his guide on independent queer cinema, for example, Gary Kramer describes Ventura Ponce's only English language film to date, the gay-themed Food of Love from 2002, as a film that, I quote, should have cemented his reputation as a world-class filmmaker in America, end of quote. Partly due to the universality of its original story, uh, David Levitt's novella, The Page Turner, uh, geographically translated here by Pons from Italy to Barcelona, but also due to the insightful way in which the film depicts same-sex relationships between men. Ocaña, Retrat Intermittent from 1978, is internationally regarded as a groundbreaking and key text of the transition in Spain. Authors such as Smith, Fernando Omira, for example, um, argue this. Not least for his depiction of a sexually liberated artist who, has, uh, who was happy to discuss in great detail his sexual experiences with other men in his childhood in Andalusia and also as an adult in 1970s Barcelona, at a time when, as we've seen, homosexuality was still taboo and his depiction on the screen was rare to say the least. Ahead of his time, the documentary showcases Ocaño's use of nudity and gender fucking strategies as key elements of his public performances. It could be argued that Ponce's explicit politically, political engagement with LGBTQ issues is limited to his late 1970s documentaries, Ocaña, and of course the very important short film, Informe sobre el Front del Avenement Guy de Catalunya, that followed in 1979. More recently, he has released um, another um, LGBTQ-themed documentary, Ignasi M, to which I will turn my attention in a few minutes. But only three of his feature films, Amica Matt in 1998, Food of Love in 2001, as we've seen, and most recently, the musical be happy that we use for the poster of this talk focus on gay theme storylines yet most of ponce's films to date explore same-sex male desire to some extent it is both the persistent homoerotic gazing of the male body in practically every film and the sometimes peripheral and straightforward presence of same-sex relationships in so many of the stories that come to define what we could call a queer subjectivity in the films of Ventura Pons. Let's have a quick drink. Athletic and sexually energetic young males populate as secondary characters many of the comedies in the 1980s and early 1990s. Unusually for that time, these young men provide much of the visual pleasure of those films, often entangling the narrative as a direct consequence of their sex appeal. And we have some examples here, one uh, from each decade, as you can see there, El Vicari Dolot, Kitty Yugis Maripili, Animals Ferits y Sabates Grossos. Uh, this is often regardless of the young man's uh, sexual orientation. Throughout Ponce's uh, filmography, there are also plenty of instances of barely coded messages for queer audiences. This includes the following. Tangential references to queer cultures, such as the uh, performance of uh, Liberate by El Titi in Puta Miseria from 1989, or the presence of San Sebastian in the more recent film, Miss Dali, released in 2018. Subtle, subtle and incidental visual investment on the male body, sometimes such as the uh, Punto Blanco bus stop advert in Barcelona on MAPA in 2007, or the gym advertisement in Ignasi M. The key role of male prostitution in La Rosa del Bar, Caricias, Amica Mat, or Food of Love. The important presence of cross-dressing in Barcelona Un MAPA or Mil Cartins. 
Before we go any further, let us turn our attention briefly to the key question of what we mean by homoeroticism. The term has been used in some psychoanalytical theory as a substitute for homosexuality to support the homophobic argument that same-sex attraction was more narcissistic than sexual. As Jan Bergeret notes in a letter to Fleas in 1899, Freud suggested that, and I quote, he should distinguish three successive stages in the emotional development of any individual, terming them autoerotic, homoerotic, and heteroerotic. The vagueness with which homoerotic has tended to be used in the humanities has also made it uh, problematic. Jonathan uh, Beinberg has suggested um, that, that this was indeed uh, very problematic, I was quoting and I will continue to quote now. It is sometimes used in art history as a convenient way to allude to homosexual content without exploring political and social implications. Yet, as Weinberg also points out in the introduction to his book on the homoerotic in American art, and I quote again, the vagueness of the word has its advantages, end of quote. Since it can be used to describe a work of art without giving excessive agency to the artist's sexual orientation, but using that factor as just one part of the analytical equation. Implicitly then, the use of the term homoerotic helps to give at least as much weight to the role of the viewer as it does to the artist and the work's production contexts. Importantly, when used uh, concerning the male body as an object of desire, the prefix homo also infers a male viewer regardless of their sexual orientation. Indeed, the term homoerotic is frequently used to refer to all male and assumed to be predominantly heterosexual contexts, where until recently at least, homosexuality was or still is taboo. Contexts such as sports, the military or college fraternities that have been um, exploited recently for various uh, good causes, charitable causes, as in the two most famous examples there um, from France and the UK. In film studies, the term has become ubiquitous in discussions of genre, genres that, uh, on the surface, have little to do with gay storylines, such as the action movie, uh, the superhero movie, the biblical epic, the western, or more recently, the vampire genre. All is studied in Mark Di Paolo's book of 2011, which I recommend. As Patrick uh, Shackman notes regarding action movies, the fact that the implicit audience of this type of film is heterosexual and male makes the sexualization of male bodies in those films highly charged and challenging. Thus, as he adds, in the action film, and I quote, homoeroticism is both consistently evoked and disavowed by the genre's specific plot devices and visual scenarios. End of quote. Be it with excuse of physical contact required by the key action sequences or by displacing homosexual anxieties onto secondary characters that are often ridiculed. More recently, the inoffensive ideologically naughty term bromance has entered popular discourses and is now frequently used in film and media studies to analyze um, films uh, and television sitcoms, such as the recent adaptations of uh, Sherlock Holmes, for example. The emergence of this term is highly indented to what Yves Kosovsky Sedgwick in 1985 described as, um, um, and I quote, the radically disrupted continuum in our society between sexual and non-sexual male bonds, end of quote. And she was writing about the Anglo-American literary canon, of course. In cinema, this enabled, I feel, a, a, an erotic relationship between the sexualized male body on the screen and the male spectator, which actually transcends the viewer's sexual, orient sexual orientation and renders acceptable the male body as spectacle. In what follows, I will explore how the films of Ventura Pons encourage this type of bond between the image of the male nude on the screen and the male spectator, partly through the film's often explicit appeal to the senses. 
Starting with Ocaña, Ponce's filmography is full of examples that illustrate the sensorial experience of cinema, often involving the male body as a subject or an object of desire. The experience is sometimes purely visual, even contained in a photograph, as we saw in recent examples. At, time, at other times, as in Ocaña, the senses are engaged through an oral account that relies on sensorial uh, memory, in this case, the sensorial memory of the storyteller, Ocaña, and by implication, the spectator's own. In the following example, the memories evoke senses of sight and touch. Caricias uh, from 1997 is perhaps the film that best illustrates the concept of haptic visuality in the work of Ventura Pons to date. From the scenes of physical violence and at the very start uh, to the famous vagina other monologue, the film regularly entices the spectator's senses of touch, taste, hearing, sight and smell. There are two particular scenes of special relevance for this talk. In the first one, a father and a son share a hot bath while the mother-wife uh, sleeps. The dialogue includes constant references to the water temperature but also to the way in which the men's bodies react to it and to each other's bodies. The explicit comparison between the two male bodies, which one is hairier, whose penis is bigger, is juxtaposed with another kind of comparison between the performance of parts of the family's new car and those of their bodies, a strategy that both dissipates and draws attention to the intense homoerotic tension in the room. The film also revisits the trope of the male body as something to be devoured and tasted. The gay storyline also reopens familiar leitmotifs that would recur more strongly in future gay film storylines, aging on the one hand and male prostitution on the other. In this case, a closet family, closeted family man in his 50s, played by the late Jordi Dauder, who was uh, 60 at the time, scrutinizes various parts of the body of his young an athletic rent boy, and wrapping it, as it were, for the film's audience. The sex scene, central to this story, is a carefully orchestrated foreplay between the two men, but also with the cinema audience, presenting the young man's nude body from various angles, adoringly illuminated with flattering tones of lighting. Interestingly, the Homme Gran remains mostly dressed throughout the scene, just unbuttoning his trousers for the sex act, while insisting that the young man undresses completely. The key scenes of sex between men in both Amik Amat and Food of Love, the film that I've been referring to from 2001, could be said to fit a pattern that Wu has described as the third body, the aging, gazing subject, which, as, I, as he says, and I quote, puts on costumes as readily as the objects of his desire take them off." End of quote. In these films, the old-young dichotomy also revolves around the context of prostitution, especially in Amica Mat. In Food of Love, the equation is established indirectly. A sex scene between Paul and his indirect employer in Barcelona is cross-cut with a scene where Paul's partner, played by Alan Codena, Play, uh, pays a male prostitute in the apartment they share in New York. The association of hearing and homoeroticism is evident throughout Food of Love. The love story between the young frustrated pianist and now page turner Paul, played by Kevin Bishop, and the distinguished pianist Richard Kennington, played by Paul Rees, is punctuated by music. 
The pleasurable gaze at the nude male body is also directly associated with the tourists' eager gazing at the architectural masterpieces of Barcelona, as we can see in this clip. So the sense of pleasure in the music is layered with the visual pleasure in viewing and photographing the architectural masterpieces of Barcelona and ultimately in touching and tasting the young male body. The first sexual encounter between Paul and Richard is cross-cut, as we've seen, with scenes of Paul's mother taking great pleasure in photographing some of Barcelona's landmarks from a sightseeing bus. As her photographic camera emphasizes the tourist's scopophilic instinct, admiring and freezing the pleasurable memory of the beautiful architecture, a displacement of her own sexual uh, frustration and her desire for Richard. The film camera seems to be just as happy to till down the Sagrada Familia as it is to pan over Paul's sacred nude body, guided by Richard's hand as he uses an ice cube to define the young man's figure while enhancing the spectator's sense of cold and hot touch, enhanced by a soundtrack that lures the spectator in a mix of diegetic, the ice cubes against a glass of whiskey, then mel melting on Paul's body, and important non-diegetic elements, uh, one of Richard's uh, piano pieces that we can hear. Touching and feeling the young man's body, therefore, is associated with playing the piano, but also with more familiar visual and oral pleasures, the architecture and the music. While the presence of a strong liquor engages our sense of taste and smell. In Amica Mat, uh, that sense of touch is explicitly associated with a young rent boy, David, played by David Selvas whose body is visually dissected in the credit, credit sequence and shown in medium and close-up shots under the objectifying red light while he holds up semi-naked um, in preparation for a client. Yet the desiring and aging male subject that often has to pay, at times only figuratively, to experience the intense pleasure of a younger male body at its peak, is also shown to be aware of his own fleshiness also in touch with his own aging body. Jauma, played by Josep Maria Po, um, his body is, is far from idealized, but he's not kept out of sight. He's still very much sexually active and full of passion for life. In a shower scene following a fight with David, the camera tilts down Jauma's uh, naked body as he lathers his skin in the shower, but then focuses on the blood as if, as if to externalize his pain, making shareable as a scary notes, and I quote, what is originally an interior and unshareable experience. But this is also contributing to the film's queering of tradition. The bleeding is but an external mark of the old man's interior suffering for his unrequited and impossible love. A queer version of the medieval model, model of the Amor Cortés, or even Christian imagery that associates bleeding with the body of Christ, as Alfredo Martinez Exposito has noted with reference to some films of Pedro Almodóvar. Although much of the passionate sexual action in the relatively more recent A la Deriva and Mil Cretins is uh, between young heterosexuals, Queer desire is also shown, and in both cases, in elderly, hospitalized patients. 
y mil cretins, we witness another very tactile relationship, as we see here, between a young man and his cross-dressing father, albeit mediated by a mirror. In La Deriva, there is an explicit sex scene between two older men. The scene, however, is fairly cold and distant, both because it is mediated through a security camera in long shots, but also because the cold lighting and the use of black and white, motivated by the very nature of images transmitted by a security camera, of course, emphasizes a clinical environment. Again, in contrast with the warm lighting of the young couple's sex scene in that same hospital setting. A young heterosexual couple, I should say. This is in clear context then with the predominance of medium and close-up shots that characterize that heterosexual passionate sexual encounters. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet in showing all the male bodies on display and in action, these more recent films of Ventura Pons expand a discourse on male nudity and homoerotic desire that has been present from Ocaña through to his latest film. This characteristic disregard for dominant discourses of masculine representation and the carnality of the male bodies presented on the screen are key ingredients of the kind of queer subjectivity encouraged in his work. In my view, these strategies culminate in the more recent documentary film, Ignacy M, to which I now turn my attention. This is my last case study, so I'm getting to the, to the end of the talk. As some critics have noted, the third long documentary in Ventura Ponce's filmography could be regarded as a continuation of the work started with Ocaña, Retrat Intermittent, 35 years earlier. Like Ocaña, Ignasi M is a gay man living in Barcelona, working in the creative arts and culture sector. Ocaña was a painter and performing artist. Ignasi, a museum expert, left unemployed as a result of Spain's economic recession, recession in the late 2000s. Both Ocaña and Ignasi M love their homeland, are closely attached to nature, art and sex. Both have a very complex relationship with religion, and both had to endure extremely hard, although very different circumstances in their lifetime due to their sexual orientation. Both documentaries are set in moments of transition, both for the protagonists and their country. The differences between the two are quite noticeable. Significantly, Ignasi M was filmed with a digital camera. The digitization of culture and the speed with which it's consumed is in fact one of the key differences between the two documentary films. Ocaña's DIY street performances, his rudimentary methods and work tools are a stark contrast with the sophisticated state-of-the-art equipment used by Ignasi when preparing major exhibitions, as we can see in these uh, two images. Now, artworks are shared online and instantly commented by viewers. In contrast, the physical archive kept by Ignatius's father, also an artist, seems almost out of place. The father's archive and his old age dementia illustrate the importance of memory, highlighted by Ignatius's work as a museum expert. If oral memory was a crucial element of Ocaña, memory in Ignasi M is visually supported by photography. Photographs of key episodes in the life of uh, Ignasi flash on the screen as if flicked on an iPad, which in fact happens in more than one occasion. They serve the purpose of introducing most of the characters, his partners, his, sorry, his parents, his ex-wife, his children, his doctors and nurses, his neighbors, his work colleagues. The presence and tolerance of all the people that surround Ignasi are perhaps the best reminders of the social change that took place in the 35 years that separate both films. The importance of this change in the development of a queer subjectivity is very clear in the very fact that where in Ocaña the artist was the one interviewed by the director, now Ignasi is in charge of interviewing everyone else about their experiences with his sexuality. Except for a photo shoot organized by his son, a professional photography, photographer, 
All the photographs shown in the film are Ignatius' own. Early on in the film, he says that he always has a camera with him. During the photo shoot, Ignatius' son asks him to adopt sexy poses, as we can see here. The session is thus a reminder of Ignatius' double role as object and subject of desire. As an object of desire, he exemplifies Ventura Ponce's emphasis on the mature male body as both desiring and sexually desirable. Yet, despite all the positive social change seen in Ignacio M, the documentary also shows a certain sense of nostalgia for the simplicity of Focania. Ignasi craves contact with nature as an escape from the artificiality of urban gay life, where in Ocaña we had anonymous sex in toilets, parks and public steps in the dark. In Ignasi M we have a much more visible but highly commercialized and regulated gay scene shown in photographs of pride celebrations in Barcelona or massive gay festivals such as circuit. And a visit to a sex shop specialized in gay men that we'll see in a second. The gay male body and gay male sexuality are characterized here by artifice. The constant injection, ingestion of medication for his HIV treatment makes him dependent on further medication to reduce its side effects. The homosexual male body may now be free from the complexes and taboos that were clear in Ocaña, but it has now become oppressed in other ways. Be the obsession with working out, wearing sin specific clothing, or using synthetic complements to intensify sexual pleasure. Sí, voldria saber que els condons, condones negros XXL. Sí. Vale, que passen per ahí. A ver, este que són els XXL. Tenía otro también, pero ya no queda. Tengo esos también negros. Mm, vale. Que esos porque eran muy chulos, muy, muy morbosos. Pues sí, vale. bien, a mí me gusta. So despite the 35 years that separated two documentary films, the key strategies of representation haven't changed all that much. Like Ocaña, Ignacy is very vocal about his love of sex with men. But he also critiques what he sees as an obsession with showing off big packets in the gay scene. Often, as he shows, these are fake, as much of the paraphernalia that surrounds 21st century gay male culture in modern capitalist societies. His critique is emphasizing the clone-like poses that he adopts during a photo shoot and later in the sex shop. Gay clones in themselves are uh, a critique of hegemonic masculinities, as Alan Sinfield has argued. Also characteristically, Ignacy M draws attention to the sensorial experience of cinema and haptic per perception. In Ignacy M, Carnality is not to be found just in references to oral sex or caresses, but in erectile dysfunction or electrodes used to soothe his chronic back pain. Chris German has argued that eroticism demands the separation of phallus and penis, that, and I quote, renders phallic idealization impossible, end of quote. Adding that for that reason, and I quote again, representations of masculinity must not only expose the male body, but must also examine the erotic sexualized male body in erectile action and limp in action. End of quote. Both Peter Lemon and Susan Bordo, among other um, authors, have explained that the reason why male full frontals are rare in mainstream cinema is precisely that the phallic mystique relies on keeping the penis out of sight. Importantly, as this next slide summarizes, in most of Ventura Ponce's films over the last 35 years, there's also a consistent queering of a male body through other means. By visually investing on men's bodies from behind, young and importantly, old, on the fissures of the male body, the films make a point of breaking the ultimate taboo in the representation of masculinities. 
Ponce's queer subjectivity is to be found in the film's oath open disregard for rigid dominant discourses of masculine representation. By openly appealing to our senses, the films draw us deeper into the spectacle of the male body in unusual and challenging ways. The male bodies on the screen are as appealing as they are abject, young and old, desirable and desiring, penetrating and penetrated, healthy and sick, but decisively not docile. To me, this is also the linchpin of his queer aesthetic, one that defies boundaries and taboos in ways that, as a queer spectator, I find politically inspiring and extremely liberating. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago, for your wonderful talk. Thank also to you, our audience, for attending this event. We will return to our magnificent building soon, but in the meantime, we continue our cultural activities on our YouTube channel and social media. Do not forget to subscribe. Thank you very much and keep safe.